we could support, how quickly we could get things out, uh, a number of factors in, in how to plan for the EAK rollout. And we made some guesses. We figured we'd added uh, a, a small number of customers each month, four or five or whatever, and just see how that went in terms of our ability to support them and our ability to get new features out uh, in a timely fashion as we move forward. <clears throat> so we didn't exactly add five every month. I'll show you the totals on the next page, but we did end up with a total of pretty much where we uh, had hoped to be. And th that was very good. Uh, the load of support we had to provide balanced with the load of development that we were in progress with, it all seemed to work out uh, nicely. And we had 41. Uh, by the end of 2020, which, uh, which was really nice. Native cross tools. Um, we've done pretty well at getting the cross tools kit updated as, as we went along, added a compiler or two, uh, each time, uh, field test. Um, uh, you'll see more about that in a few minutes, but we're, we're ready to start a real. Uh, wide field test uh, at the end of uh, June, and then the production release when everything is ready to go. So, given where we were nine months from now, I think we've done uh, pretty well and are still moving along. And here's a if, if you look at our website, uh, you'll recognize this picture, but it's the uh, timeline of what we've done so far, and you'll see the addition of the H release at the 14th of April which is our next scheduled and final EAK release. So we added users uh, each month or each, each release uh, pretty steadily, and uh, that moved along nicely. And we're scheduled for the 14th of April for the next one. And then we're moving to 9.1 at the end of June. And I have a slide or two on what exactly that means. <clears throat> but we will continue uh, the progression of regular updates to the release. So there'll be a 9A, a 91A, a 91B, and uh, whatever we think is necessary in there. And eventually we'll just turn the crank and say, it's ready for production. And that's when it becomes 9.2. Uh, so most recently release, which we call the G release, is uh, 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 10th of February. Uh, and the big new addition there was our support for VMware. Uh, we've had some updated cross tools, uh, an improvement to tra traceback. I put this in the traceback in here just because I thought it was interesting. That it seems like a minor thing, but we noticed that whenever we announce uh, a next release, there'll be a handful of people who will get back to us literally within a few hours that they're up and running. And the very first person that got back to us after the G release noticed immediately that traceback has improved. So the small things can make a difference for uh, whoever's out there. Uh, we've added the ability to look at process dumps. Uh, not complete yet, and I'll say a bit about that in the future. Uh, reserve memory, system service intercept. Uh, some more entries for the, the deck set kit. Uh, notice that this is now a PCSI kit, no longer VMS installed. Uh, and the open source world Kerberos, and then many updates for, and I could list a long uh, set of things here, but in particular, boot manager, deck threads, exception, memory management, SDA. You can imagine the list goes on. But I think the thing to notice about this slide is the, I'm going to say, wide coverage of where the improvements are coming each release and not just concentrating in one place. And that has been a good sign all the way, and we've tried to maintain that. So targets for the 14th of April. Uh, we will be shipping on the 14th of April. I mean, the train leaves on that date. You're either on it or you're not. Uh, we have a restriction currently in H for VMware SMP to two CPUs. We've lifted that, and I'll talk more about that in a minute. Uh, the our version, the new version of TCP IP services uh, will come about in the April release. 
Uh, we know we'll have updates to see Fortran and Macro, and there may be others too across tools. Uh, OpenLDAP is in the works. Uh, there's at least one or two more DEXCEP tools I think will be, become part of that package. Uh, one of the things the current process dump uh, capability does not include the ability to look at threaded applications. And we're hoping that that will get into the uh, April release. Uh, parallel processing library. Uh, there are a couple uh, things about install that haven't been done yet. Install resident is one of those. Uh, system service logging, very useful tool. Uh, DECnet phase five. Uh, just recently, we've added DCPS, the print service, uh, to the April release, and another open source product, Mosquito. So again, a nice handful of things to appear in a release, and a, a wide scope across the system where they are uh, they are appearing. Um, a word about TCP/IP. <clears throat> As most of you know. Uh, we went down uh, a path towards a new TCP IP services that just, it did not turn out well, to put it bluntly. Uh, technically, it wasn't what we, we had hoped as we discovered on our own and the customer feedback was uh, not good. And also some of the original reasons that we did what we did, uh, our development abilities have changed, let's put it that way. So, we're taking uh, what used to be the HP TCP IP services, and we're adding some open source modules to that, building a release for I64, porting that to x86, and we will build and release that in the H release in April. And originally, uh, initially, just Telnet and FTP, uh, the two things you have now with what we are shipping. So this was a, uh, a giant step for us. Uh, and I think it's going to turn out quite well and will serve us much better and customers in the future. So in H, we hope to be replacing the TCP ICP that we have in the current appliances that we uh, provide with uh, uh, version six. So moving towards 9.1. This is my what's in a name slide. Well, in this case, there is a big difference. 9.0 A through H. This is a small, very directed set of customers. And 9.1 will be open to all BSI customers and partners. The EAK resulted from a questionnaire that many people filled out, I think we're up to close to 80, or maybe a little more than 80 questionnaires. These were volunteers. They knew what they were volunteering for. Uh, so we knew what they needed in terms of compilers and layered products and networks and so forth. And we also, from that, knew what they could live without for a while. So we got to balance what we had ready with what various people needed. And this work worked out quite well. Uh, uh, a number of the questionnaires would say they needed X, Y, Z. Well, I would send a particular customer a message and say, we don't have all of those yet, but we do have a couple of those. Would you like to get started now, even though we are missing some things you need? The answer was almost always yes. So people were willing to be on the bleeding edge and be without some of the things they ultimately needed. So this helped us a lot in, a, in us able to uh, keep the cadence of getting a handful of new uh, customers involved each month. So 9.1 will be open to all customers and partners. We know there are holes in what we have today and those are the things we are working hard to fill. But I wanna keep uh, emphasizing that there won't just be a 9.1 and then all of a sudden a 9.2. We want to continue our fairly regular cadence of getting out releases. Now, as we move into 9.1 and not too far into it, uh, we've got to have most of the system in place or there'll be tons of people that it won't be useful for. And that's what we don't want. 
because my last bullet up here is the most important thing is we need to get more people engaged as soon as possible. And the best anyone, any best anything you can do to help us make 9-2 the best product that we can make it is get involved and give us some feedback. So 9.1 at the end of June. Here are some of the things that are very high list on, on our target at the moment. Bare metal support for the DL380. Uh, we run on both Gen 9 and Gen 10. Um, we need to get bare metal support out there. And but I would I have to say I was pleased that for people who filled out the questionnaire, even though they said we ultimately need to run on bare, on bare metal, we can start out with virtual box at KVM right now to, just to get started. That helped us a lot. So if any of those of you uh, uh, are in that category are with us today, thank you. We need a real installation procedure. Uh, it's going to be an ISO file, no physical media. Up to this point for the EAK, all its releases, we have been providing appliances, an OVA file for our virtual machine environments. But once we go to the installation procedure, I'm hoping that we will get to it for all environments pretty closely at the same time, if not exactly. Uh, we'll be uh, providing more TCP IP utilities by then, uh, and we want to make sure that we will have uh, clustering with shared storage. Uh, security server is also uh, high on our list to get out there. And the goal of all of this is that we want people to be able to take an x86 x86 system, whether it's a virtual machine or bare metal, and get it integrated into a current environment to see what uh, x86 will be really like for them uh, as they do that. So 9.1 isn't just more features coming along. It's a, it's a bigger picture. More people involved, expand your environment and help us. So let's move on to uh, platform support, bare metal and virtual machines. So we focus at this point on virtual machines and the big news for the G release was our support for VMware. So <clears throat> our testing on VMware at this point has been a virtual box, KVM, uh, and then the uh, VMware Workstation Player, Fusion, and the ESXi. So for VirtualBox, uh, people run on Mac, run on Windows, and Debian. Uh, KVM, uh, we at VSI run on CentOS. Uh, we have a customer who is the KVM on Debian user. And the VMware 3 that you see there, we all do ourselves. And I've said a million times, a virtual machine is just another platform, the VMS, like another piece of hardware. But like all pieces of hardware, all virtual machines are different. Uh, and not only that, a particular brand of virtual machine is different on various platforms as we're discovering every day. The, the things that always make a new platform virtual or physical different, uh, there are things like environment variables how the physical configuration is presented to us, how you keep track of time, different drivers, what, what a console like. There'll always be something, multiple somethings. But we've made a lot of progress, especially in the VMware space in the last three months. Just to give you an idea of, of what some of this is like, we ran a virtual box in KVM for a long time, many, many months. But when we came to VMware, it was very problematic. Nasty problems that took us weeks and weeks and weeks to figure out. One of the things that happens when you boot in a UEFI environment, uh, our boot manager, for all intents and purposes, is a UEFI application. And you ultimately, declare yourself, we're done with boot services. Well, that worked fine for VirtualBox and KVM, but all of a sudden we couldn't get anywhere after that. 
And it took a lot of help from a, VM, a VMware developer at a public forum to whom we are very grateful. Turns out that VMware is very particular about the state of the system when we declare executing exiting boot services. That was not true of VirtualBox and KVM. But we all ultimately overcame that and had to change a little bit about how we come up and hand off and so forth between the boot manager and sysboot. But nonetheless, the bottom line here is a new virtual machine, it made assumptions that the previous ones we had run on did not. Another thing we ran into, uh, and this was VMware on Fusion and Workstation Player, the DCL wait command of one second took forever, you know, 10, 20, 30 seconds. Uh, well, that was very interesting. Obviously, a case where Fusion and Player behave differently than ESXi. Well, the problem was uh, Fusion and Player don't give us an HPET, which is the thing we're really looking for. Its other option, what it, which was the default, was its own LAPIC timer. And evidently, we do not interact well with its LAPIC timer. We will probably have to look into that. But we discovered that you can force it to use an HPET by manually fixing the configuration file, which is what we've done. Uh, but that all turned out to be very interesting. Uh, uh, one of those things that you, how could it be so different from one version of VMware to the other? And it was just a matter of the default that we started with. Another thing that was interesting about VMware as we moved on to larger systems uh, in the SMP environment, we were good with two CPUs, but more than that, uh, it was a dead end system hang. And we ultimately discovered that there was a CPU waiting for an interrupt that never happened. And we finally got to the point of recognizing that during our boot path recognition of CPUs and the uh, APIC, we had some CPUs thinking that they were on APIC and others thinking they were on X2. Uh, how did we get that to that point? I can't remember. And it obviously worked in lots of cases, but ultimately we had to uh, realize that, way well, they weren't the same. So the fix was to make all CPUs uh, talking the same language. Surprising how long it can take to figure out things like that. But those are just some recent adventures with VMware. And we're still in very early stages with VMware. Okay, new slide, if you were here two weeks ago, this is new. Uh, two topics I'm trying to illustrate in this slide. Uh, and each column uh, represents something different. So there are various VMware licenses, which I have listed in the left-hand column. And in the right-hand column, I have listed the versions of those things that we, VSI, have tested on. I'll talk about both of these separately, uh, but in the left-hand column, you'll notice the asterisk down at the bottom, and the ones that I have indicated support virtual serial lines in their guests, and we'll see why that's important in a second. In the right-hand column, I've got the versions that we have tested on. These are the only versions that we can write at the moment guarantee that our appliance that is in the G release works with. Uh, and we'll get to that right here. So let's do the, the appliance, the right-hand column first. We've shipped an appliance, a VMware appliance, uh, to match configurations that we've tested on and we know to work. Will it work on others? Probably. Will it, work on, will it not work on others? Undoubtedly, and we're finding that out already. We can't possibly provide uh, off-the-shelf appliances for all these possible combinations. Impossible. And the answer, ultimately, is the real VMS installation, and that will eliminate this issue altogether. And we're working very hard to get to that point. What we do between now and when we get to the installation, I'm not sure how many different uh, appliances we can accommodate. We're trying to come up with something it will engage more people prior to getting to a real installation. 
Now the licensing problem, <clears throat> this was even more interesting. Uh, if you look back here, you'll see that uh, from top to bottom on the license column, this is the, on the top there, they're more expensive, a uh, lot more capabilities, and the expense and the capabilities go down as you go down the list. So what we've discovered uh, is that they not all provide the capability for a serial line in your guest. Well, as many of you know, BMS requires a serial line for its console. Been that way for 45 years. The answer to this, uh, the real answer to this, is we need to implement a driver that we had not planned to do until after 9.2. So this is going to put a wrinkle in schedules or somebody's work items. We don't know exactly what yet, but we were we are actively looking at a real project plan and a schedule because this is incredibly important. Uh, we cannot leave all these on the left-hand column without an asterisk high and dry. Obviously, there are some business decisions to be made there, but we're going on the assumption right, right now that we need to support all of those. There are some very back-end things that we've uh, been reading about that can get temporarily around this console problem, but they're not viable for the future. Uh, and uh, they're interesting and we may pursue a couple of them that could help a few people, uh, but the real answer is uh, a new driver. So this and this are really re revelations that have happened in the last two to three weeks. We're still very new in the VMware game Took us a long while to get where we are, but uh, we're conquering things as we come to them. Uh, just an example that we got by the, the two CPU problem. Uh, I've got a couple of screenshots here. Uh, and just for the record, I don't cheat on screenshots. These are real. Uh, I have a, a 64 CPU instance on ESXi that I run. Uh, that was just a, a simple output from it. And on that same system, uh, one of our tests, many of you may be familiar with UETP, uh, good exercise of the system. Uh, and on my 64 CPU instance, I've got 300 UETP processes running. Um, I took a big screenshot here, but I cut a bunch of stuff out of the middle just so you could get it and see it all in one place. Uh, and the most interesting thing on here, uh, if you look across the, uh, uh, the header column there where it says PID, process name, state, priority, IO, et cetera. There's a column there without a heading between state and priority. And you see the numbers like 17, 39, 49, et cetera. That's the CPU number on which that process is running. So if I had expanded the whole thing, not eliminating the 52 lines in the middle, you'd see in this case, uh, 61 current processes, all on different CPUs. Um, all as well uh, in terms of configuration, in terms of uh, showing the configuration and processes running, uh, things look pretty good here. Let's move on to hardware. We are not abandoning direct hardware platform support. Yes, we've concentrated on virtual machines up to this point, there are many reasons for that, uh, but now we need to move back to some uh, hardware platform support as well. We are not going to be able to test on tons and tons of hardware platforms. Uh, we know that everybody should realize that. We'll start out with a few, but what happens after the DL380 will largely be up to uh, what customers uh, respond to as to what they need, and we'll just have to proceed from there. So new developments. Uh, I have another problem here I wanted you to hear about just because it was so interesting. So three of the systems we have in our lab, we've got a DL380 Gen 9, a, GL, a DL380 Gen 10, and DL580 Gen 10. So at first, we booted on number one and number three, but not number two. And just think about that for a minute. DL380, GN9 was good, Gen10 was not. Oh, 
works. It's a Gen 10 problem. Well, the Gen 10 580 was fine. What we were running into was that on the 380 Gen 10, part way up during VMS boot sequence, the, the, the platform would just reset and go back to square one. It was very hard to pinpoint when that was actually happening and what was causing it. We finally convinced ourselves that it wasn't a, a just a Gen 10 problem because we compared a lot of output to the, the 580. Eventually, and I mean after a long time, many, many weeks, we finally zeroed in on a particular instruction that was causing a page fault. Now, as it turns out, uh, this was, I'm going to say, I know I what the right, right, right word is, an illegal page fault, an unsolvable one. Anyway, the hardware threw up at hand, its, its, its hands and went back to its uh, three strikes in your out policy, which means the platform gets three things in a row that it can't handle, it's over, and it does a reset. We eventually nailed some of this down and got to the point where we needed to use a different version of the interrupt dispatch table than we were using. Uh, this was a huge debugging effort for a long time, but ultimately solved, but it's just another one of those, you're on a different platform, no matter how minorly different you think it is, something will happen. Uh, so that's pretty much the story on virtual machines and uh, hardware platform support at this point. Let's move on to everybody else's favorite topic, compilers. The best thing I can say here is they are not happening soon. You just have to be patient. When we ship 9.1 at the end of June, it almost undoubtedly will be cross tools on I-64, just like we are doing with the EAK now. There's a long list of things that go into this, but to get the native compilers, the number one thing is we have to get a more current LLVM backend code generator than what we've been working with for the last 10 years. There are multiple problems in getting there, but a couple of the biggies are LLVM is written in C++, and it is, as you know from uh, it, looking at the website or participating in the EAK, we don't have a C++ cross compiler. We actually looked at what it would take to do a C++ cross compiler and determined that it was just so much work that in the long term, we, we were better off throwing our resources at doing the real thing to get to the native compiler as, as quickly as we could. And uh, I, I think that was still the right decision even though not having a C++ in the cross tools is a big hole. We understand that. So the method that we're going about doing this is we're compiling the new version of LLVM modules on Linux. Move those objects to the i 64 system and use our cross linker to, uh, to create the libraries and move them to x86. That's an oversimplification of a huge task, but that's that, those are the real uh, easy steps to understand. Okay, so we've got LLVM and all its friends with it on x86. Now we have to create compilers, and this means adding uh, uh, our own specific changes to allow LLVM over the last few years as we have developed our uh, converter and using LLVM, we have made some changes. Those have to get put into the new LLVM. We have to get the, the compiler front ends onto x86. And then we have to port open source Clang, which gives you C and C++. So there are a number of steps in getting to any native compiler. Uh, our native compilers will not just magically appear all of a sudden, all at once in a single release. There'll be a couple, then there'll be a couple more, and there'll be more. Uh, how many steps are involved there? I don't know, two or three. We'll just see how we get there. But it's pretty much a guarantee that you won't all of a sudden get like 9.1-B and all the native compilers will be there. Uh, they'll come uh, you know, over time. Another thing is when we first have native compilers, 
they will not be optimized for sure. Um, and that, that, that's another whole step after just getting there at all. Currently, the native compli compilers are slated for Q3, which means they will arrive in uh, 9.1a, b, et cetera. Uh, that's pretty much the whole story about the schedule and how we need to get there. C++ is a particular case, obviously, because we don't have one now in the cross tool skip. <clears throat> and the first one for x86 that will appear will appear. Uh, Native. This means porting Clang to VMS, a very big job in and of itself, just for this one compiler, because it will be new to us. And I've got six or seven bullets here that uh, describe some of the things that have to be done in order to get there. <clears throat> all of that takes time, but this, this is all in the works now. Uh, and in getting to uh, the LLVM list, when you go back here, much of what you see on this screen right here is in development and progressing quite nicely at the moment. Uh, when it comes to getting uh, to the point of porting Clang, well, that opens up a whole new world in, in and of itself. There'll never be a C++ in the cross tools kit. As I said before, we evaluated that and just said no. On the one hand, C++ is clearly the priority for getting to native compilers because it's the one big hole we have right now and it's preventing a number of people from uh, starting to use VMS on x86. So we need to get there and we know that big job, but it's clearly the, the number one thing on the list. But it also doesn't mean it's gonna be the first one that will appear just because of some of the others may happen very easily and we'd like to get them there. So look for native compilers uh, sometime in Q3. So before I, we open it up to your questions, <clears throat> I thought I'd provide a couple answers that uh, we know we always get. So let's get them off the list. They're usually pretty easy. Everybody wants to know about RDB. Uh, we know it's in the works, but we can't speak for Oracle. I mean, it's a, it's a short answer, but it's it. <laughs> If you need to know about RDB schedule, you need to talk to Oracle. People ask about Hyper-V. Well, yes, uh, it's the next hypervisor that we will uh, uh, look to supporting after we get uh, done with uh, what the three we have now and uh, move along a little further. We've poked at this a little bit in the past, but haven't really gotten serious yet, but it is, it is definitely our next hypervisor to support. What about other platforms, uh, AMD, AMD instead of Intel, Dell, other HP platforms. Um, the DL380 right now is the only thing we're going to promise for 9.2. If something else happened, yeah, that would be gravy. But anything other than what we're currently claiming for 9.2 is going to have to have to come later. Um, will there be a binary trans like later like we've had in our previous two boards? Uh, right now. We have no plans for translating either alpha or i64 images. Uh, there are 100 questions you can ask about performance, but here, a couple things to keep in mind. Uh, we're still very early in the game, and it's just not worth pursuing at all until we have native compilers and probably a few other things. So we don't even think about it. It would be a waste of time to spend any time trying to analyze anything now. Um, the other thing I can point out is that we don't have a whole mass of debugging code that's extra in the 9.0 releases and when we get to 9.1. What we do do is ship with system check and pull check uh, turned on, which means that there are a handful of images that when they are loaded and the system comes up, they are a special version of those images that has a lot of debugging and tracing code built into them. So do we have anything extra? No, if, and if you wanted to turn off uh, those two things, you'd get down to uh, the basic code without our debugging stuff in it. But we haven't added a ton of stuff that all of a sudden is making the system really, really slow or things we have to take out. 
I think that's it for me, Terry. Let's open it up. Okay, Claire, thank you very much. Great presentation as always. Um, I, I think that, um, <clears throat> again, uh, you see that, uh, we hope you see that progress is being made. Sometimes it's a lot of little steps, and uh, this is going to continue for, for quite some time as we try to look and understand what uh, customer requirements are. Uh, we need your input. We want your input. And um, so it's, it's uh, don't be surprised if uh, we do more maybe individualized reaching out to you to, uh, to gather some of that information as we continue to move along with the x86 product. So now's the time for uh, questions and answers. If you have uh, any Q&A, please put them into the Q&A box in the, uh, in the webinar. And uh, Claire, uh, we have a lot of questions already. So um, let's see, we'll try to put a few of these together here. Um, but let's, uh, let's start. Um, so what is the impact of alignment faults on an x86 architecture? It, it's virtually zero. There's almost nothing that the software can uh, get involved with or do. Um, it's almost, you know, almost takes it back, back to something like a VAX. But anyway, all those things that we've done in terms of analyzing alignment faults and such, uh, right now, given what we know, there are no plans to do anything. Uh, may we get to the point where it matters? I think there are a couple of things you can actually turn on uh, that will allow uh, a user process to see something. But right now, it's so minimal of an impact that it's not even on our radar. Okay. And, and a bit of a follow-up to that. Um, to aid in tracking alignment faults down, are there any plans for tracking and easily displaying alignment faults on a per-process basis, perhaps? Yeah, I think I have the same answer. Yeah, okay. When will the replacement TCP IP stack be available on a V.X release? Um, Claire, I can probably answer that. Um, just uh, well, I, got I some... had to, it's, it's actually in in one of the slides. Okay. The, uh, our our new TCP IP for Telnet and FTP. Uh, we are trying to get ready for the H release in April. Okay. In testing now. And to go to go beyond that, the, at least the uh, it looks like the tentative schedule. I got this from Steve Nelson. Um, later in Q2 on 9.1, um, on TCP IP services, uh, 6.0, Telnet, FTP, updated versions of BIND, GATE-D, NTP, OpenSSH, and DHCP. Yeah, and, then, I, and I think part of that is le at least is on one of the slides. We're looking to expand beyond yeah. FTP and Telnet in the 9.1 release at the end of June. Yep. And Steve mentions uh, basically for 9.2 full TP, TCP IP yeah. services. Sure. Good. Good. Okay. Uh, let's see. Um, I'm hoping you will address antivirus in this presentation and move to x86 means VMS far more likely to get virus infections. You want to comment on that, Claire? Um, we'll get there. But it's just not immediately on our radar. Uh, we understand the problem, yes, uh, and everybody uh, assumes that if you run on X86, you're more vul vulnerable. Yep, don't dispute that at all. But uh, we've got a lot of basic things to do before we get there. Okay, good. Uh, to Anne, in fact, to everyone, um, will there be a replay? Uh, the webinar from two weeks ago is already up on our website, and this webinar will be uh, probably by uh, Monday of next week. So, yes, uh, that's available on our website. Uh, let's see, is there uh, the procedure calling standard for x86 available yet? Uh, yes, uh, I think I think we even mentioned that in our advertisement for the, the uh, EAK users. Yes, we have available an updated version of the calling standard. Okay. Will subsequent releases of 9.1 AB C, et cetera, et cetera, be available as updates, or will new installs be? <laughs> That's something I should have had on the slide. Uh, installation is coming pretty soon. 
Uh, we know update kind of goes hand in hand of that, but it's a pretty big project and it's going to be in, it's not going to happen in 9.1, that's for sure, but it will be, <clears throat> as the question uh, asks, somewhere in the ABC range in there. Uh, but yes, update is still a ways away. It's not going to happen right when installation does. Okay, thanks, Claire. Will shared storage on SDS or only on physical storage? Ooh, hadn't thought much about that. Um, I don't know the answer to that yet. We'll have to look into that some more. We'll okay. provide something and when we get these written up and on, on the website. Okay, good. Uh, the February slide for version 9.0-H uh, specifically mentioned the basic cross compiler. Today's slide was missing that line. Does that mean 9.0-H will not have the basic cross compiler? Unknown. It might, it might not. We just, there are just so many other things that we're looking at that are higher priority and we know it's missing. We know people are waiting for it. Uh, would I like to think there would be an H? Yeah, I'd like to, but uh, not something we want to publicize too much at the moment. Okay. It could, but chances are against it. Um, okay, the next question really has to do with hardware, but I think you've addressed that. Um, why has a security server been such a challenge? We had to convert it from A to, to C. Okay. By the way, a huge job. Um, any CLI work being done or planned for 9.0H or 9.1? Nothing in particular. I mean, if, you, if you're talking about the basic mechanics of DCL, no. Okay. Um, if you had an application now that has C++ and Pascal code, could it be built for the x86? Well, not today, because we have no C++ cross compiler. But that is in the plans, definite plans. Yeah, when, when we have all native compilers, sure. Right. Um, any update on the ADA compiler for OpenVMS V9 <laughs> on x86? <laughs> well, actually, until yesterday, I would have said no. But in fact, uh, I've learned that we have a few people who are once again pursuing another possible path to get an ADA compiler. No details yet, very early in talking stages. It may not happen, but we are once again heading down a, a possible way to get to ADA. And I'll just which add I think to is that. Pretty, which is pretty good news compared to what I would have said two weeks ago. Thanks, Clay. I'll just add to that as well that uh, we are reaching out to those customers who we uh, understand or believe are using an ADA compiler uh, to to try to gather some uh, specific data and information. So if if you are um, an ADA compiler user, please send us an email. Send me an email. Send it to uh, info at vmssoftware.com and uh, let us know that you're there. Um, because uh, we, we need to also justify some sort of a business case for this. So that would be very helpful. Thanks. Oh, Terry, since you just mentioned that, I'll put out the same request for people who plan on using VMS on VMware. Tell us what versions of VMware you have. Tell us what licenses you have. Great point. Will the new native C++ compiler, when it's available, be available on Integrity and or Alpha? No. No, that's not in the works right now. Uh, okay, let's see, continuing on. Uh, this question is about ADA. Hopefully we've addressed that. Uh, question on the Oracle, whoops, Oracle client. Um, you're probably referring to the announcement from Oracle at the end of last year uh, on their, what is it, their 11G, um, what we call classic product and the Oracle client. Um, we are presently working on various alternative solutions to uh, ensure that you can keep your OpenVMS environment uh, 
maintained and growing. Uh, so if you have a specific question, uh, please uh, send us an email on that because we've got, we've got some specific uh, things in the works. And uh, in fact, we just had a conversation with a very good customer yesterday on this topic. And it's um, we want to make sure we're all offering very solid uh, alternative choices for you. And we think we've we've got at least one uh, right now. Um, let's see. Will you have support for VMware standard 6.7 when version 9.1 is released in June? In June, I find it highly, I mean, you, you can't run standard without, standard does not support the serial line, our console issue. Are we going to have a solution for that by the end of June? No. Okay. Uh, what should partners and clients do to participate in 9.1 testing? Uh, well, yeah, I don't know the mechanics yet. Maybe Terry does. I was uh, going to say, I'm not sure we actually worked out the mechanics, but I guarantee you, if you send a, uh, send us an email that you're interested in participating, again, send it to info at vmssoftware.com, you'll get a response and you'll, you'll get on the list. Uh, in fact, that's a good point. Thank you for that question. Because we need to formalize that for um, uh, for customers and for partners. I mean, eventually there'll be something on the website that anybody can use. There will, yes. Um, will you be sharing any of your experiences and pitfalls discovered during the development of compilers? As a company, we need uh, to port our own compilers and any help and guidance would be much appreciated. Claire, you want to? Address that well, comment on that first, and I'll I'll follow sure. up. Sure, I've suggested that the next webinar, you know, a month or two, whenever it is, ought to be just on compilers, and that that's the time that we we could pursue that. Uh, I, I'm sure John would <laughs> like to tell you the war stories. <laughs> In fact, that uh, that webinar is tentatively scheduled for April 20th. Just to uh, if you want to make a note of that, but everyone will get invitations. I will also add to that. Uh, as I mentioned very early on in today's webinar, that we have uh, significantly beefed up our resources and our professional services teams. So, you know, situations may arise where you may call upon uh, those teams uh, to, to provide assistance to you as well. Uh, let's see. I think you've addressed the COBOL compiler availability. It's in the cross tools now. Yeah. Um, okay, let's see. Uh, what about support for Cisco UCS? Don't know. Okay. Uh, we'll, we'll get back. Dave, we'll get back to you on that one. Um, you say initial compilers. Uh, not an option with full uh, optimizing compilers. Will will optimizing compilers be available for version 9.2? And will VMS be built using optimized compilers for 9.2? By the time we get to 9.2, as in the production release, yeah. uh, yes, you will be able to use uh, the, the optimized switch. But initially, as I said, uh, compilers will, the, will not be optimized. But they will be when we get to 9.2. And and hopefully a little earlier than that, so we get some field test uh, experience with uh, the optimized. Great. Um, let's see, porting or postage database running on OpenVMS, not only the LIBPQ agent question. Don't know. Okay. We'll get back to you on that one. I'm using mostly a Lenovo servers, so based on what I'm seeing now in the slides, it looks like support will be after version 9.2 comes out. Is that correct? Are uh, you talking about bare metal? Uh, if the answer to bare metal is, uh, we have no idea what we're going to support for bare metal once we until we get beyond 9.2. Yeah. Okay. I think as I made a comment, this is an ongoing thing, so there'll be additional releases after 9.2, and that's where we need. Customer feedback like this, that's that's great. Oh, okay, I see the next part of it is with VMware, sorry. Ah, well, that's another story. Uh, 
we hope to support VMware for anybody who <coughs> wants to use it. However, uh, we know we're going to run into things that we won't be able to test ourselves, and, and it's just going to be a matter of, would you like to be a volunteer and help us figure out uh, how to run on a particular platform? So if, it's, if you're talking about VMware on any platform, uh, we hope we can get there uh, to satisfy everybody, but it will take work. Um, how about LAT support? Uh, yes. Okay. You mentioned that you originally planned to develop the serial line driver after 9.2. What use would it have been if you need it already for booting? Just to support more VMware variants? Well, uh, as it turns out, that's what we know about VMware at the moment. I mean, VMS has always required a serial line for its console. Uh, and when we ran into the VMware license issue that doesn't support serial lines, well, we can't handle that right now and we have to develop a new driver. So yeah, that, that's very high on our priority at the moment. And I'll say that an interesting thing we discovered that if you are running a VMware's standard license and you look at your guest configuration, it allows you to actually add a serial line device to your guest, just like we do on uh, what we run here. However, when you try to access it, the error message that comes out in the, in the log file is very clear. It says, your current license does not support serial lines. So you need to get over this problem because we know not everybody has uh, Enterprise and Enterprise Plus. Uh, next question, uh, where's IA64 support in version 9.x? Wow, as of, I can probably answer that one. As of right now, in fact, as of uh, several months ago, we decided uh, at this moment in time not to proceed with a version 9 on um, integrity. So that's that's where that stands right now. But this, at the same time, that doesn't mean uh, I-64 won't get uh, updates and even new features. Right, right. The roadmap mentions that GFS2 will be investigated after the 9.2 release. Is the plan to use GFS2 for clusters only or will it support standalone systems as well? The, the plan at the moment is a new file system isn't really even on our radar right now. And any thoughts about it, we just we just have to put off until after 9.2. So uh, there's nothing really concrete I can say about what might or might not be done. Uh, here's, a, here's a summary question. Um, for clarification, when will x86 version be end user ready? I, Claire, I'll let you address that, but I guess part of that is depends on who the end user is. And what well, I would take that question to mean, when is it going to be production quality? And that's when we ship 9.2. Right. Which is basically on the roadmap at the end of this year or right after the first of the year, right? In terms of field tests, there's, there's tons of things that are, and, and, app, and users and applications can do right now. But I, I would take that to mean, when's the production release? Uh, let's see, I think we addressed the question on Ada. Which is the best performing hypervisor for a VM with OpenVMS, KVM or VMware? No idea. We'll get there someday though. Okay, I think we just addressed uh, target release for full production, 9.2. Uh, yes, the webinar will be on the website. Uh, um, um, why is the new TCP IP stack not on alpha? The alpha is way behind even Itanium patches. It's for right now, it's, it's simply a business decision. We are focused on, uh, on X86 to get that out the door, get the production release out the door. Clay, I don't know if you want to add anything to that or not. No, that pretty much says it all. Okay. Red Hat 7 does not contain the Q35 chipset and probably will not ever. Is there any workaround at starting up the VM 
on RHEL7.x. Haven't tried anything or thought about it beyond what we're running on right now. And we've just, in fact, started to uh, dip our toes into the, uh, the RHEL world, which we haven't yet before. So I mean, we, we run KVM on CentOS ourselves, uh, but we know we need to get to uh, what's it like to run on RHEL. We're not there yet, but we will fairly shortly, I hope. Okay, great. Does the Gen 9 slash Gen 10 requirement apply only to bare metal or must VM host be that generation of Intel processors? Architecture question. It, it should not matter. Uh, however, like I've said before, if you try to run uh, a hypervisor on something we haven't run on, um, <laughs> and if you do, we'd love to know. Tons of variations. These things can be run with hypervisors, but the hypervisor uh, does not necessarily reflect old or new underlying hardware. When is Deck Windows going to arrive, and what will it contain? Server or client? <laughs> uh, I always get these two backwards. Uh, what what we will support, as we have in the past, is that. If you um, you have a workstation of some sort, I mean, a, a PC, and you want to uh, run an application on a, a BMS system uh, as a host, and you get the output blasted back to your, your little uh, PC, that we will support. But we're not going to support uh, uh, the equivalent of an alpha workstation, for example. OK. Uh... We've got a specific question from Don. Um, I think what we'll do, Don, we'll uh, we'll take that one offline, and give you a specific answer to a a bit of an involved question. Um, let's see. Did not see a timeline for cross compiler for basic. I think you commented on that, Claire, but maybe yeah, I, I have, but yeah, yeah, I I, I know we're not very specific here. Uh, is it possible basic would be in the H release? Maybe. Uh, I think it will certainly make it by 9.1 in, in June, but it may happen before that, but no promises. Uh, mixed clusters? Question. Well, clustering in general works today, and a handful of people have tried uh, various uh, systems put together. Um, we should support the same type of things we support uh, on Itanium in terms of c configurations. Uh, I know people have clustered, exa for example, uh, an x86 instance with uh, what a, a, an alpha running a, an alpha emulator, for example. So, I mean, remember, cl clustering is a software feature; it had nothing to do with the hardware. So. I think that's the bottom line. If something doesn't work, we'd like to know about it. But in, in general, clusters are clusters, and we support them now in the EAK. Is there any interest in developing a hardware abstraction layer to enable OpenVMS to run on any old x86 thing? Uh, it, uh, you, if I'm not sure I understand the question. I mean, it sounds like is it will ever be a uh, BMS uh, as a hypervisor in in and of itself. Uh, I can't imagine that ever happening. Yeah, we'll we'll take that one offline. Yeah, uh, I, I, there is there is another repeat bit of a repeat question. Can you just comment again on Hyper V support? Uh, yes. Uh, so far, we've concentrated on VirtualBox, KVM, and VMware. Hyper V is next on our list to pursue. Um. So, Paul from the West Coast missed the first few minutes. It's, we know it's early out there for you, Paul. Uh, is there a macro cross compiler question? Uh, the, the macro cross compiler has been in the, the cross tools kit since day one. What about options for us that do not have any IA or any integrity systems, any uh, VSI cloud system where you can get an account to cross-link the x86 images. 
Uh, not that I know of, but that's an interesting question. And in fact, cool, Mr. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Actually, I think uh, it, it kind of ties into something people often ask about when we ported to Itanium, we had uh, porting workshops. <clears throat> I believe that Brett and his team are thinking about the equivalent of a porting workshop, but some facility that we provide in the cloud. So what this question implies to me is we may have an answer for that someday, but we don't right now, but I know what they're after. Cross tools in the cloud, since they have no hardware themselves to run it on. Okay, thanks, Claire. Um, next question really has to do with ADA. I think we've commented on ADA that there is some interest um, at PSI, some initial activity going on, and plus we want to make sure we understand who the customers are and what their interest level so we can build a business case at the same time. Um, so as we already mentioned, there are two components of EMS that were written in ADA, security server and the ACME server. Uh, security server is almost ready to uh, to put in a field test. Hackme server will come someday later. Uh, thank you, Peter. Here's a comment on our new website. Looks much better. Nice to hear. Um, we are using VMware Essentials running V6.7 on ESXi on Lenovo servers. Oh, okay, I think this is from an earlier question. Um, will you be sharing any of your experiences and pitfalls discovered during the development of the compilers? I think we addressed this question. We did. Uh, yeah, we did. It's a it's a repeat. Maybe maybe we didn't address it as well as they'd like. I'm not sure. Um, hoping for support on VMware standard. Also confused about support for VMware Workstation Player. Are you specifically differentiating? that from VMware Workstation? Yes, the difference between standard and workstation. Uh, we know we boot on workstation because we do it ourselves. We know we don't boot on standard because standard uh, doesn't allow the serial line console, which we have to have a driver for. But we will get there. It's a question from Tony about the um... Uh, Oracle client on SQL Relay. Uh, yes, that is one of the alternatives that uh, that we're working with, as well as some others. So, Tony, happy to uh, have a conversation with you or line you up with with uh, Brett Cameron or someone else who can go into more detail for you. Um, okay, we've got someone who is saying they submitted a survey but haven't heard back. Okay, well. You're talking to the you're talking to the man and Claire. Uh, we'll 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 respond to you. Just just send me mail directly. I'll answer. I'll look into that. Yeah. Okay. Good. Uh, will you be porting the existing Fortran compiler to x86 or moving to Flange? Uh, existing Fortran. Okay. Although I know there's been conversation about Flange in the future, but that, that that's not on the radar right now. I think we've already commented about the current target date for 9.2, which again, Claire, I'll let you repeat. Um, we're looking at the end of this year, maybe early next year. It depends 99% on the feedback we get from the 9.1 releases. I mean, if things go well, it'll happen fairly early. If things are not looking as good, I mean, no one cares how fast we can get it wrong. So it's gonna depend on feedback. How different is exception handling on VMS version 9. Dot whatever x86? I recall the differences with exception handling on i64 across some fun. Yes, the difference is huge. Okay, we have a general question about our subscription based licensing. Um, so, so the question is, do you plan on uh, adding uh, permanent licenses again? So our, our policy on this is, is, is pretty clear. Um, we offer uh, subscription licenses to all customers. That is our product offering. 
however, we do realize there can be very unique exceptions, and we are uh, always willing to entertain what those exceptions may be, as it may um, have to do with some very serious matters uh, for, for government or uh, uh, high security situations, um, you know, where, where people's uh, livelihood uh, or people's lives uh, may be um, may be involved. So we are not opposed to that. Uh, when will we be getting debugging? Ah, the debugger is also another huge project. Uh, it won't be an H, that's for sure. Uh, I'm hoping that we'll get to it fairly early in the 9-1 timeframe. Will it be possible to migrate an existing Itanium OpenVMS 8.3-1H1 to VMware environment? Uh, the only thing that is going to run in VMware is nine dot something or other. Yeah, so I think uh, I think the question is about the migration of of a HPE eight point three one H one. I'm assuming to move it to nine point two, so or a later version. I'm hoping that we would be able to upgrade from uh, previous releases and so forth, but if you're talking about moving applications, everything has to be uh, recompiled and relinked. Right. Will S86 version 9.1 be, uh, be able to join a cluster of alphas and itaniums running 8.4-201 and 8.4-2L2 respectively using SAN storage? Uh, uh, we are trying to get to the point where we <clears throat> we can have shared storage. That's the point. That's one of the things we're working on right, right now. So clustered with Itanium and Alpha, yes. And we're currently working on the drivers necessary for uh, shared storage. Thanks, Claire. Uh, yeah. For for you Azure see, and sorry, you, guys. you'll see that on the slide that I had up there for uh, uh, nine point one. Uh, DL380, and I think clustering shared storage is right on that list. Okay. Yeah, if you want to pull that back up, you can do that for everyone. Uh, for Azure and AWS, they use VMware, but you won't know the back end hardware, parentheses, often homegrown. There's not, I'm not sure if that's a question, more of just a statement. Well, I, I think the question is <coughs> how dependent is VMware or how dependent are our version of VMS and VMware on the underlying hardware? Um, VM, on the one hand, you would think that VMware is VMware. Uh, I'd like to think that's true too. Uh, and in, in particular, we want to get to the point where if VMware itself provides the things we need, the un underlying hardware doesn't matter. Will that be true in every case? Maybe not, but that, that should be the goal. Yeah, screen's frozen up for a minute. Okay. Um, what about options for us that do not have any Itanium system? Any cloud system where you could get an account to cross-link the x86 images? Well, that's what we talked about previously. Yeah. For direct hardware support, is legacy BIOS supported or do we have to use UEFI? UEFI. Which for DL380 means Gen 9 or later. Gen 8 did not have UEFI. But yes, you, there, there were two things that VMS ultimately has to have, no matter what, 64-bit and UAFI booting. Okay, uh, there's another question. Uh, I know we've talked about Hyper-V already. Uh, I don't know if we specifically talked about a timeline. Do you want to comment on that, on the Hyper-V no. support? Okay. No idea. 
when will existing deck windows functionality be available in 9.x? Well, I know we build uh, the back end part now. Um, I will look into whether it's going to be a 9.1 or not. I hadn't thought about it. So the question we need to get back to. Okay. Um, there's another comment question from Tony. I think this would be a good one to take offline as well. Uh, we'll get back to you on Tony. Uh, <clears throat> will process software's TCPIP stack work with x86? Uh, you'd have to ask them. Okay, um, clarification on a, on a question. Um, the question has to do specifically with support plans for VMware Workstation Pro versus VMware Workstation Player. <laughs> Another thing we just ran into the other day. Um, we, uh, Workstation Player is what we've been testing on. Uh, we need to look into Workstation Pro. But given what we know about player, sounds like it's very possible. But, you know, who knows where VMware draws the line on this serial line issue? We, we just have to find out. But that's an easy one we can find out. Okay, Claire, we've got a request uh, that you put up the uh, ESXi licensing slide back up for us. Uh, okay. So if you could do that, that'd be great. Yeah, so somebody's going to tell me all the mistakes I have in it, probably. <laughs> We're very new at this, by the way. It's taken us a long time just to get and boot and run on the three things we have. <laughs> uh, okay, looks like the we'll we'll give that slide a couple of minutes, and then somebody else is asking for another slide on uh, VMware editions and versions. So, why don't you give it another minute or so, and then pull that one up? And, and the question has to do with uh, any testing going on again, please. So you can see in the right hand column here, these are the versions that we have tested ourselves. And we've now witnessed a real live system that was running standard and we understand what appears and it's very clear that their license doesn't support the serial line. So that's another one we've seen in action. Thank you, Greg, if you're on the line. Okay. Um, you want another slide? No, I was going to say we're just running out of questions here, but it was just one popped in. Um, okay. Will customers under maintenance contracts have to buy new licenses to move to x86? Uh, this depends upon the uh, support agreement that you have. Um, in some cases, uh, customers will have to buy uh, the x86 licenses. In other cases, uh, depending upon their license configurations, they would they have rights to new versions. And for a like-to-like -like change from what they have today to x86, um, there would not be a charge. Um, again, there, there's a lot of details here, but it depends upon their uh, specific contract if they have rights to new versions. Happy to discuss, of course. Uh, let's see, any... Well, I think we talked about this one, but let's, um, let's just uh, touch on it again, Claire. Any feel for when the TCPIP um, x86 release will come out? We will have Telnet and FTP in the H release in April. And we hope to have most of the rest of the pieces in place by the end of June. Yeah. Okay, thanks. I do not see any other questions for the moment, but let's give folks uh, another moment or two if they want to uh, ask. And uh, while we're giving them uh, a little bit of time. Uh, again, I will repeat that the webinar from two weeks ago is already up uh, and the 
the main content of today's slides are already up on uh, on our uh, website, uh, and that this webinar with all of the questions, et cetera, and uh, Claire's slides will be up on the webinar probably by Monday or Tuesday of next week at the latest. We want to thank you for your participation and um, and your interest, and uh, we're we're grateful that you're here and. Uh, Again, I think all are all, all things are going in all the right direction. Uh, we're very optimistic, a lot of excitement, a lot of buzz within the company and 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 seeing all all these great questions, uh, a lot of interest uh, external to the company uh, for the um, worldwide open BMS customer base. So I think oh, wait a minute, okay, one just popped in. Do you now have T TCP IP services source license? Uh, I don't think I want to. Well, I, I don't know what to say here. Uh, right. We can take that one offline. I, I I know who it's from. Um, and, and we know him, we know him well, so we can take that one offline, Claire. Okay. Thanks. Okay. I'll leave the hard ones for you anyway. <laughs> thanks. <laughs> okay. Well, again, thank you all for your time. Um. And, and interest, we appreciate it. Again, uh, tentatively speaking, our next webinar is scheduled for April 20th, as Claire mentioned. Um, it will be focused on compilers and the progress that's being made uh, from now until that date. So please look forward to that. Uh, and there may be also additional information coming out through some of the email blasts that we do uh, on occasion. And uh, thank you again and have a great rest of your day wherever you may be. Take care. Bye-bye. See you.